Hey, welcome to Parker's Pensies. This is a bonus episode uh, of the podcast. I might just keep this on YouTube. If you're listening on audio, then obviously I didn't. But uh, I got some breaking news, and we don't do breaking news here on the podcast very often, but I'm pretty excited about this. Um, real quick before we get to the breaking news, hey, subscribe to this channel if you're watching this. Um, you'll get lots of really good content. Just do it. Subscribe. And also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, that means I did upload it to the audio. Would you just leave me a five-star review? Like, it's not that hard. Just click. Uh, most of you listen on Apple Podcasts. Just leave me a five-star review. That would be huge. Thank you. And then uh, if you guys like this this channel, if you like this podcast, uh, if you want to see it keep, uh, keep around, if you want to keep this channel around, you want to see me here more talking with guests, serving you in this way, please uh, consider becoming a Patreon patron. Link in the description, all that good stuff. Big news, and I'm stoked for it. So uh, without further ado, let me just pull in the person who's breaking the news, Dr. Ryan Mullins. Man, uh, I'm stoked about this, and I, I I'd like to puff myself up a little bit and say that I guessed this news, but uh, man, man what, what's, what's up? What are we talking about? Okay, so I've only got one semester left at the University of Helsinki. So looking forward to figuring out what's next. And so one of the big exciting uh, pieces of what's what's the next chapter for me is I'm going to be a visiting professor of philosophy at Palm Beach Atlantic. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Which which for those who don't know, that means he's going to be my professor and this is yes. going to be awesome. Uh, exactly. I'm so stoked. So uh, you're going to be a visiting professor and the class that you're teaching is going to be contemporary topics. Mm -hmm. uh, so so what's the content of that of that class that you're teaching? Yeah. So the idea is, um, was this like, it's like every other year I'll be coming down and doing a super intensive course. And so for this first one, this is going to be in January of 2023 mm -hmm. is what we're looking at. So I'll be coming down for a week to hang out with everybody there, all the master's students and giving you a super intensive course on God, time and creation. So we'll be looking at models of God, providence, creation, life after death, this kind of stuff. That's huge, man. And we've talked a lot about this stuff on, on the podcast. I think this is like your fourth time on. I think, um, yeah, I think that's right. Which is fantastic. I thought about this and I thought, um, what if someone thinks, well, you know, I've, I've heard all this stuff. I listened to the reluctant theologian. And I thought, man, if you've listened to that, then you're primed to take this class. Like you're primed mm -hmm. for it and you get to come and ask your questions. Uh, so you said it's a super intensive. That means you're going to be there on campus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the way these intensive courses work is they bring somebody down for, and they're there for like the whole week. And so I think it's like four days mm -hmm. of, of just like, we're just in the classroom, we're teaching, we're debating, we're like discussing. Eight hours. Yeah. 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 It's a long day. Um, but I, I used to do this with, uh, with Keith Yandel during my master's just having yeah. for like the whole weekend. And it was just, it was just, yeah, it was great. And then, uh, just, just to get to hang out and get to know the students more, uh, is kind of the big idea. So yeah, just super intensive stuff. Just going to go all right, here's some basic philosophy of time. Now let's get some like really nitty gritty details in philosophy of time and then just see what are the theological implications for all of this yeah. for our Christian beliefs. It's, so yeah, it'll be much more detailed than anything I've done on the podcast because you can only get so detailed on, right. on when you're talk, trying to talk to the public. Whereas this is, I'm like, you're master students. You're trying to master something. We're yeah, going to get detailed. Dude. Oh man, that's good. And I, I thought about that too, because uh, like I was saying, telling you off air, I think of this podcast as like an office hours for my guests. I always read their stuff beforehand, try to come up with my own questions, but like, these are my questions. And so you out there listening, you can come ask your questions uh, of Dr. Mullins, which I think just awesome. So you get to hear You've, you've heard our conversations, you've heard his conversations, but then you get to go, Hey, I heard you on this, this, and this, what do you think about this? And then you get to, you know, write a paper for him, which, which would be awesome. Um, I did notice, I was looking up your stats uh, before this, you're like, a, you're a member of like a philosophy of time, like association or something. Can you, can mm -hmm. you just say something about that? Yeah. So the Society for Philosophy of Time, um, it's this group based out of primarily based out of Germany, but we we do this annual. Well, actually, they do a bunch of different workshops, little workshops all over Europe on just a tons of different topics in philosophy of time. And the one that I've, I've always participated in is this annual workshop on God and time. OK, so we've had one. The first one was in um, was in Bonn, which is where uh, Beethoven is from. Okay. So like I'm just wandering around Germany this like this one day like before the <laughs> conference and like I'm like where am I? And then one of my friends who's she's like uh, she plays bass and works for these all these orchestras and she's like Beethoven's house is just down the street and I'm like oh and she's like you didn't put any th thought into this this trip <laughs> did you? And I'm like 
low. <laughs> so yeah, so like I've just been able to take me to some really cool places. So we've done that. We did. We were in Vienna. Uh, we were in Lugano, which is in Switzerland. Um, this year we're going to be in uh, Ireland. We're going to we're going to Ireland this year for okay. the for the workshop. So yeah, it's 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 a really cool network, and it's, I've been able to meet so many interesting people working on cutting edge stuff in philosophy of time and trying to yeah. figure out like how does this fit with theology and religion. Dude, that's so awesome. Yeah. So um, I brought that up because it kind of just just bolsters like this is why you're teaching the class because you are <laughs> someone in this field. Just real quick, do, is there a is there a consensus in the philosophy of time on uh, a different model of time? Like, are they atheists? Are they be theorists? Is it all over the map? Oh gosh, it's all over the map. There's even debates about if the A theory B theory distinction is really useful and what that really means. Yeah. Uh, whereas, like ontology of time, most people are pretty clear on what those distinctions amount to yeah but like a theory b theory ooh, it gets kind of dicey and then people okay. are just, just they're just everywhere i mean they just fall on everything which is what's forced me to really think through okay let's really look at all these different views and see what are the implications so it's not just like presentism and eternalism or yeah. a theory b theory it's like oh actually there's like 12 other options here and i'm like <laughs> okay, well, what does that do for, um, I don't know, creation or life after death? And yeah, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's forced me to think through a lot more issues than, than I originally realized were even available. Yeah, dude, I love that. I'm, I'm like trying not to get too excited about the research paper I want to write for you, but, <laughs> sure. but like growing spotlight and God, that would mm -hmm. be awesome. Um, so yeah, so God, time and creation. I'm excited about that. Uh, I, while I've got you here though, I've got a couple of just questions mm -hmm. about some of your pieces and, I, I didn't do you justice when I was talking with uh, Linda Zegzebski about omnisubjectivity because you got this creepiness mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. thing. And I, I just kind of roughly brought it up to her, but I didn't I didn't like go over it beforehand and I should have. Um, but a lot of my listeners will have, have that fresh in mind because we I just had her on. Can you I, I'm, you know, pulling this out of nowhere. Yeah. Can you just lay out the creepiness um, problem for omnisubjectivity? Yeah, it's a problem that because I haven't heard the interview, your interview with Linda yeah. recently, but she just sent me an email after your uh, interview and she was like, hey, I really need to read this paper because yeah. I keep getting asked about it. I was like, yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff on omni, omni subjectivity like that's coming out. So here you go. Um, so it's it's a it's a problem that she touches on. And I think she actually does answer, but she didn't seem to think she had fully answered it. So here's here's the big idea. So you if you say god's omnisubjective you're going to say he has like maximal empathy yeah. he is supposed to be able to have this perfect conscious grasp of all creaturely conscious states so he really understands your first person perspective mm -hmm. to like in every single detail so it feels all the things that you feel and he understands exactly how your evaluations go and so the problem with creepy emotions the way it initially goes yeah, with like Richard Creel is just to go, so God feels everything I feel. Mm. So you, you're saying God feels horny and you're like, <laughs> oh, it was really uncomfortable to say God's horny. And then right. the way I kind of tw try to twist the knife a little bit, just rhetorically is like, well, okay, there's these panentheists who say that the universe is God's body. Yeah. And you want to say God's like maximally horny and we are God's body. And oh, gosh, that just, I, that just, it just feels like creepy at this point. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. 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 Uh, Chad Chad McIntosh was like, "Hey, did you bring up the horny god objection?" I'm like, "I I don't phrase it like that, but um. <laughs> yeah, hardly anybody does." But um, but yeah, I, I was chatting with uh, Ross Edman um at a conference in in uh, in Texas a couple months ago, and and he hadn't heard that phrase yet. And, mm. But he had like a student come up to him like going like, "Oh, because they were I think they were talking about obvious subjectivity in class," and he was like, "Yeah, but how do we?" how are we going to deal with uh, the horny God objection? You know, the one that Mullins is talking about. And, and <laughs> Ross was like, e -e excuse me, what now? <laughs> oh man, that's wild. Yeah. So, um, do you have, are, are you sympathetic to omni subjectivity? I am. I've got some worries about it though. Um, because I think I can make the, what I try to do in the creepy objections paper is try to make the argument even more precise uh, to tr try to really nail down what the problem exactly is. Because yeah. you might just be like, well, so what's wrong with having creepy emotions? Yeah. Uh, and so here's the idea. So if you're a passibilist, you want to say whatever emotions God has, they have to be perfectly rational mm -hmm. and, uh, and consistent with God's perfect moral goodness. Yeah. Because you don't want God having like immoral emotions. Uh, and there's different examples of how this is supposed to go. So Richard Creel just throws the horny like uh, example out there, but he doesn't do anything with it. The yeah. one he focuses on is um, a sadist uh, torturing an innocent victim. Yeah, that one seems good. I mean, yeah. horrible, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Exactly. It's a good example for the argument, but it's, it's awful in real life. <laughs> yeah. 
because what you want to say is like, well, okay, so the, the sadist is like delighting in mm -hmm. the in torturing the innocent person. And you want to go, that's wrong. Like that's morally wrong. Like you yeah. should not delight in that. Yeah. And and so you go, okay, well, if God knows what it's like to delight in torturing an innocent victim, well, then that's an immoral emotion. Yeah. And, and then if you add another kind of claim, which I think is, 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 is very plausible, which is that moral considerations are rational considerations. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing something immoral, you're doing something irrational. Yeah. So if God has this immoral emotion, then you could say, well, he has an irrational emotion because he's got the wrong evaluation of yeah. the situation. He's, he's got the, so you can be like, oh, well, then God's emotions are not perfectly rational and they're not perfectly moral. Yeah. So, so um, I've wondered about this. I asked, I asked uh, Dr. Zeg, Z I'm going to call her Linda. I asked Zin Linda, I understand that I, I shouldn't, but her name's too hard. Uh, does God know what it's like for, for Parker to eat a Chicago style hot dog? And does God know what it's like for God to eat a Chicago style hot dog? And she wanted to say, yeah, for Parker, omnisubjectivity and uh, through this mechanism or tool of empathy. And yet, you know, for, for God, no, he'd have to incarnate or maybe he has counterfactual knowledge or, or something like that. And I, I think that's right. I wonder if that distinction works with the creepiness that God knows what it's like for Parker to have a creepy emotion, but it's not like it doesn't transfer into like a first person perspective for God. Um, so yes. God knows it. What, what do you make of that? I think that's right. And that's basically what she alludes to in um, her Aquinas lectures on okay. omnisubjectivity. And okay. so what I tried to do is just detail it, like a, tease it out a little bit more and get some more options on the table. So, so yeah, so it's, so whenever I empathize with you, I'm like, well, this is what it's like for Parker to feel this way. Yeah. Uh, and I can feel those feelings and everything. And then, then there's also, it's something that it's like for me to empathize with Parker. Yeah. Uh, and those are two different states. Okay. Uh, and me yeah. empathizing with you doesn't mean I agree with your emotions. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so that's how you get out of, that's at least like I, for what I call the Zygzebski option for getting out of the problem of creepy emotions is to yeah. go, well, God it, it knows what it's like for the sadist to delight in these things. And then there's also this other state of affairs, which is God empathizing with, knowing what it's like to empathize with the sadist. Yeah. And then God makes his own judgments on that going like, that's what it's like for you to delight in mm -hmm. uh, torturing the innocent. Uh, that makes me feel like revulsion, uh, yeah. you know, and then all the strong like, language you see in the old Testament of like, God's very upset um, yeah. when, he, when he sees you doing these horrible things and, and you're like, well, that makes sense because there are times when you empathize with someone and you go, I understand why you feel that way. I still, I just, I just can't, I cannot accept that this is the right like way to feel or view this, this situation. Yeah. No, that's really good. I, I think she, yeah, she uses the language. I'm trying to look through my notes, but something she uses like entertaining and I forgot the philosopher. Mm -hmm. You can entertain this. Um, and she pulls from someone. I, I thought that was good. Mm. Um, what though? I think I brought this up to her too, but uh, if you're using the empathy model, it seems like you would need me to be born in or, and ex have these experiences in order for God to know that. Um mm. So if you're if you if you're like a block uh you know four dimensional block universe type thing, uh, okay everything's happening at once once God creates it whatever you do with God and and time there but if you're an atheist I wonder how does God have knowledge that what it's like for Parker to stub his toe tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, if that's not the if that's not the case yet I guess. What do you, what do you yeah. make of that? Do you know what I mean? I see what you're getting at. So there's a couple issues you could get into. So one is Zygzebski's claim that, um, that omnisubjectivity extends to counterfactuals. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So, so one, so one issue is like, okay, so imagine God all alone, not created anything yet. Yeah. And can God empathize with all these possible worlds to figure out which world to create? Yeah. And then from there, um, depending on what theory of time you've, you want ontology of time you want to put in there, you can ask this question of like, well, okay, so does God empathize? So say presentism is true. Well, can God empathize with all those things that are happening in the future? Mm. Well, they're not happening because um, they don't exist. Right. Uh, so can he empathize with these non-existent states? And on eternalism, you'd be like, well, the whole block's there. Right. Um, is there something there for God to empathize with? Yeah. So I think these are important issues. So, um, and the answer I think kind of boils down to something similar. So let's start with the the case of God all alone hasn't created anything at all. Yeah. 
And he's like, okay, what universe do I want to create? And what kind of universe do I want to create? You know, what's going on here? And then in Zygzebski, she's like, okay, well, God, uh, in order to figure that out, he has to somehow empathize with all these possible worlds mm -hmm. and uses his obvious subjectivity to do that. So that way he fully comprehends this exactly what it would be like to create this universe. Yeah. And I want to say, no, that's not possible. Not at all. And here's why. Because empathy, part of what it means to empathize with someone is not simply knowing that you have an emotion. Uh, so, it's, so that's part of it. I know that you have an emotion. I also know what it's like to have that emotion. Mm -hmm. And then something about you, something on the basis of you is what grounds my emotion. My, yeah. Yeah. And if you yeah. don't exist, if nothing exists other than God, there's nothing to empathize with. Mm. Possibilia? Uh, possibilia aren't the sort of things you could empathize with. They don't have conscious states. Right, right. So you're not, there's nothing to grasp. Yeah. So yeah, you could say God uses his imagination, I guess, but that's still going to be qualitatively, or yeah, it's still going to be a different kind of experience from uh, experiencing an actual universe. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I really like omnisubjectivity and I've had this concern too um, after studying some philosophy of mind type stuff. But but it seems it seems like it's even a problem for omniscience because if that's the case and we go with Mary and mm -hmm. uh, you know Mary has for those who don't know Mary is a, a color specialist who has all the physical facts but she's never seen color before she comes to see color and, and has a new quality experience and people debate whether that's a new concept or knowledge but it seems like it's knowledge God could have all these uh, imaginary facts about me like and he's a perfect imaginer perfect reasoner he could know in that way but until i have that qualia state of tasting coffee god wouldn't know what it's like for parker to taste coffee in the qualia sense he would know mm -hmm. all the facts about it and stuff maybe that's enough for a perfect reasoner or something but it doesn't seem like it seems like this a categorical you know difference oh so you're worried like if god couldn't know that then he wouldn't be omniscient yeah it seems like a problem for omniscience i don't think it is um so if you take omniscience, so here's one definition of omniscience. Uh, God knows all the facts. Whatever the sum total of facts are, God knows them. Mm -hmm. Well, if if that sum total of facts does not include what it's like for Parker to drink coffee, well, okay, fine. Um, God still knows it then. Uh, and so here's here's a way to see this kind of play out. So like open theists, they, they love to make this strategy to say like God's still omniscient because you know, he knows all the facts. They're just about the future. Mm, yeah. There just aren't. Yeah, there, aren't there are no much. facts there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you can do the same thing to the Molinists and the and the Calvinist as well, because the, the Molinists and the Calvinists, they have this distinction between God's natural knowledge and God's free knowledge. And uh -huh. then the Molinists are like, I'll oh, give us some middle knowledge in between yeah, those right. two. Sneak it in. So, but we can ignore that for the moment. So at, at God's natural knowledge, um, he knows all the necessary truths. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there's no truths about what will happen in the future because he hasn't determined anything yet. Yeah. So will God create a universe? He doesn't know that uh, because it's just there is no fact of the matter. Yeah. Does God know which universe he's going to create? Well, no, there is no fact of the matter. It's not until he freely decides to create. And then on the basis of his free knowledge, then he has foreknowledge. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, well, it's all happening at, at once in eternity. And it's just a different logical moment. Yeah, so, logical moments. <laughs> yeah, right. from all eternity, God did not know and did know what he was going to create. Yeah, see, no, that's I'm problem. sorry. That's, that's nuts. Um, so, but yeah, and, you if, have you, and this if you don't, if you don't have that distinction and it's a necess, it's all and is necessary, then you get modal collapse because oh, it's yeah. like, well, God was forced to create. Yeah. And I'm necessary yeah. and me drinking coffee is necessary. And that just seems crazy because yeah. like, clearly like you could have been like, no, I didn't, I didn't, I did not have to drink coffee today. Yeah. Like, come on. God did not have to create a universe. Like, yeah. 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 So even within these distinctions that you, you see within like more like traditional kind of views, like within Calvinism and Molinism you have this idea that there are certain things that God does not know at certain points in either logical moments or actual moments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah dude, that's good. Yeah. There's logical, because you can pin anyone with that because mm -hmm. they have the logical moments. Yep. So there's a logical moment where he doesn't know if he's going to create or not. And if he yep. does know that he's going to create, then it's be, then it seems like mortal collapse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically the, all, all it does is illustrate this point of, if you say that omniscience is just knowing the sum total facts of reality, mm. and if something doesn't fall in there, uh, well, does it not strike against omniscience because omniscience is just knowing the sum total facts of reality. And that seems to fit with anything that an open theist, a Calvinist, a Molinist are going to want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what if, what if someone said, oh, shoot, this is tough, dude. Um, <laughs> That's all right. Because we don't want to, we don't want to have, a lot of people don't want to have God uh, changing. 
And there's also a the problem with creation. We've talked about this and, mm -hmm. and uh, whether that's an external relation or internal or whatever. So, um, oh, I might've just lost what I was thinking. This is, oh yeah. Okay. So God's omniscient, like qua, um, the existence of the world, including, oh, you sure. know, whether there are abstracta or not, but the whole world, not just the universe. Um, but prior to the creation of the world, God could have had, God could have been less than omniscient. All there is to know is himself and the possibilities that he could create or not. What, what, is, is, can we get out of it by saying that? I don't. I, so um, Ben Arbor like has a, yeah. yeah, Ben Arbor has some arguments like this because he wants to say if God creates an open theist world, then God's not, doesn't have as much knowledge or he wouldn't be omniscient. So why would God create an open theist world? Why would he oh, want to? Yeah. He's like limiting and so he kind of makes this move. Yeah. That's not I, so bad in a Christian view because we think that God, you know, in the incarnation, he... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Ben wants to use that to try to argue for like a, a moving spotlight theory of time to oh, say okay. like... Okay, now I'm interested. Exactly. I thought you'd be interested in that. Yeah. So you've got this eternal block of time and you've got some other kind of thing that like flows along it to say like, that's the present. No, now that's the present and so on. Um, I want to go, well, no, 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 no. If omniscience just is knowing the sum total facts of reality... Well, it, if God decides to create an open theist world or a world with a moving spotlight, yeah. well, either way, he's going to be adding facts to reality. Yeah. So you haven't changed the definition of omniscience. You've changed the content of God's knowledge, but that's true either way you go. Because mm -hmm. you go from God knowing the sum total facts of reality are I and I alone exist to knowing, oh, I created an open theist world or, oh, I created a moving spotlight. Yeah. Look at the mo moving spotlight go. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know how you can really avoid changing God's knowledge unless you want to go um, just with a full eternalist ontology of time, which is all moments of time equally exist and they're all co-eternal with God. So there is no state of affairs where God exists without this created universe. Yeah. You could do that. There are yeah. consequences. I can tell, tell you what those are in a second, but um, yeah. yeah. Well, so that's like eternal creation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you lose creation ex nihilo. Yeah. And that's wild. And then also I love how you've motivated that you just like, you know, you didn't poison the well in like the, uh, the, uh, in the fallacious informal, sense. yeah. in the informal yeah. fallacy sense, but it, the well has been poisoned for me because of you, because it's like, well, we, we talk about eternal generation and I'm still, you know, whether the sun is auto mm -hmm. or not, but I don't like that language being also applied to creation, like eternal creation, eternal generation. It seems like now we're getting a little too close mm -hmm. with our doctrine of creation and, and, uh, the, the second person of the Trinity. Yeah. Cause if you do want some clear distinction to be like the sun is not created. Ooh, well, yeah, the eternal, the eternal generation is supposed to be it. And you'd be like, well, God's right. also eternally generating the universe. Oh, Ooh, it's not great. That's yeah. It's not great. Not great. Yeah. I mean, some people will be happy with it. Cause some people are like, well, yeah, the sun's not fully divine. He's the firstborn of all creation. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to say that, but no. you know, <laughs> but, you, but you can, these are options you can have, you know? But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you could, but but should one? And, and the answer is no. Um, okay, okay, okay. So we got that. Um, so you're going to be talking about models of God, too. Mm -hmm. um, any chance we're going to get into, like, uh, panentheism? Or, yeah, panentheism type stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we'll most likely be doing is we'll be going through my book from Divine Time Maker to Divine Watchmaker. Nice. Yeah, so um, the, the manuscript is basically done. I'm just going to like next week, I've got this super secret um, uh, workshop on it with a, a bunch of specialists and some grad students and whatnot that are reading through the manuscript. And so they'll give me their feedback and I'll revise it and send it out. So by the time I teach this course, hopefully that'll be probably, it'll probably be the pre-published uh, draft because awesome. how long it takes to publish a book yeah, seriously. is painful. Um, so yeah, we'll probably just be reading like this is the forthcoming book. And so nice. what I do is I take, I primarily focus on classical theism, neoclassical theism, open theism, and panentheism. Okay. So we'll have a lot of discussion on panentheism. That's going to be huge. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really excited for that. And I think your work on panentheism is going to be more and more uh, relevant as panpsychism comes up mm -hmm. because as, um, as like Philip Goff, uh, friend, he's coming on the podcast, uh, as, as his work grows, more and more Christians are like, well, what, at panentheism, why don't we suck that in? And then mm -hmm. I'm always like, well, I've got a paper for you to read because <laughs> it's really hard to demarcate panentheism. Mm -hmm. What the heck are we talking about? So um, have you, have you, I remember last time we talked about it, you said you'd, you'd be uh, updating, revising that kind of stuff. Have you thought more about panentheism? Is it able to be demarcated yet or? 
I, I think so to some extent. So okay. uh, that's one of the things I do in the book manuscript. And then I have two other papers that are coming out. One is on um, the axiology of, mm -hmm. uh, of panentheism. So uh, Kirk Lougheed, he's written a lot on sh uh, this problem of like, should we want God to exist? Yeah, like, yeah. Was, would that make the world better or worse if God mm -hmm. exists? And so he's got this forthcoming book just looking at, here's all these rival models of God and, and you know, what model of God, what is, how does that impact the values that exist in the world? And so they asked me to do the, the panentheist uh, chapter. And so like, first thing was like, okay, if it's going to be valuable, it's got to, it's got to be distinct from these other rivals. Uh -huh. Otherwise, should I want a panentheist God to exist? I don't know. Like, yeah. would, would it, would it make a difference? Uh, because uh -huh. it looks exactly like all the other ones. Um, and then another paper I've got is this uh, forthcoming book on panentheism in uh, Western and Eastern philosophy. Mm. And so I'm that one. I'm looking at a lot of uh, a lot of Hindu and a lot of Jainist uh, text, and to try wow. to like look at some different things there. So the main thing to demarcate it is going to be this. So you're going to have to say that something unique about the nature of God entails that God has to create a universe. Yeah. Uh, and and so so you're trying to dig in there, and then you have to say something unique about the nature of God that explains that catchy slogan that the universe is in God, but God's more than the world. Right. Right. Uh, and so we talked a bit about, I think on the last time I was on, or one of the last times I was on about the way to cash out that catchy slogan, which mm -hmm. is you could make uh, space and time attributes of God. Yeah. But you could also be a neoclassical theist and affirm creation out of, out of nothing and say that because that's exactly what Isaac Newton and Samuel Clark said. Right. Um, and so there's been some, some interesting pushback. So, uh, on, on that because um so there's this book that came out about a year or two ago on panentheism and uh i think it's carl pfizer i think is his name or pfeiffer uh, carl pfeiffer okay and so he points this out saying like yeah, okay like ryan's done some interesting work to kind of push this agenda uh to like try to demarcate panentheism but he's like that doesn't work because you could have some other model of god say that space and time are attributes and i was like I've known all along um, <laughs> that, that was that was the case. I just didn't know if anybody else would see it. Uh, yeah, because I knew it. I knew for a fact that I was like, I was like, this isn't, this can't be it. Yeah, uh, and he pointed it out and was like, yep. And I can give you some concrete historical examples of this too. Yeah. So you that, gotta have to. So I really do think you have to say something interesting about the nature of God that explains why God has to create. Yeah. And so one way to go is um, there's a couple options. One is to say. Well, God's perfectly rational. We all know that. You're like, yeah, okay, I'm sure. Everybody agrees on that. And you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. but like, there's a best possible world, uh, okay. and like, God has to create a best possible world. You know, like, okay, well, that doesn't necessarily tell me anything interesting about the nature of God. So that, yeah. okay, what's going on here? Because everybody says God's perfectly rational. So what yeah. you're really doing is you're saying, well, there's a best possible world. So you're not saying anything interesting about God. You're saying something about oh yeah, creation. Yeah, right, right, right. So you've not demarcated. Well, there's this other crazy thing you can say about the nature of God that a lot of people flirt with, but don't like to fully go on in. And this is about uh, the nature of goodness being necessarily diffusive. Mm. And so sometimes this is called the Dionysian principle because it's you you see it in pseudo Dionysius. Yeah. And so the nature of goodness is to be necessarily diffusive. Uh, so the idea would be if you if it, if the thing is like perfectly good, it just has to create more goodness. Yeah, it just it just has to it just has to keep multiplying more and more and more as much as it possibly can. And a lot of people in the classical tradition flirt with it, even a bunch of open theists like so like Richard Swinburne, uh, William Hasker, uh, Keith Ward. So these kind of open theist sort of guys, yeah. they even they even flirt with this principle. Everybody loves flirting with this principle, but hardly <laughs> anyone wants to just go all in and be like, yep, God has to create. Yeah. And yeah. so the panentheists would just go stop flirting with it, put a ring on it. Like, let's just go for it. <laughs> right. God has to create. Well, um, yeah, this, this principle I've seen come up. Um, I, I wonder, I think maybe cla uh, class Cray is using that to, to motivate the multiverse. Mm -hmm. Uh, so God ha would have to create a multiverse. Um, but I, I'm sure he has like a, if God were to create then, so it's kind of conditional, but, um, yeah. yeah, so, so God would have to necessarily create. And I can't remember if we talked about this or not, but well, I mean, we got to fit our model of physics in there. And so if like mm. Big Bang cosmology is what's up today, would would they just go with like a bang crunch type type thing? God's body is a bang crunch that it's mm -hmm. collapsed and, and grown. Yeah, that's what you see uh, with Tom Ord. And then you also, or at least he lays that out in one paper. I don't know if he's like fully committed to that, but he's like, yeah. at the very least you can say it's a view that he thinks is interesting. It's impossible space, you know, yeah. you could affirm it. But that's certainly what you see in a lot of Hindu philosophers. 
I mean, it, it really oh, wow. is the case from all eternity. God has been creating a universe, and then the universe lasts for one day of Brahman, um, which I forget exactly how long that is because they've got there's some debates about the exact calculations of what okay. how long a, a day of, of of Brahman is. Um, but it's in the it's like in the millions of, of billions of years kind of thing. Okay. And so okay. I'm like, if you want to debate, like, it's just like debating like the age of the universe. Is it thirteen? Yeah, is it thirteen thinking. and a half billion years? Like, right. You know, I'm like, I don't care. Whatever. It's old. <laughs> yeah. So that's the claim is like, so God kind of like he wakes up and he breathes out this universe. Uh, and then as he's about to go to sleep at night, is the way the metaphor goes, well, then he destroys the universe. Mm. And then in between the universes, there's this state of quiescence is the phrase uh, where God and all the souls that have not been reincarnated again, because there's nothing to be reincarnated in at this moment because the universe okay. has been destroyed. Right. So God and all these souls are just hanging out. And then after that, God creates another universe and reincarnates all the souls again. Okay. And he just has been doing that forever and ever for all eternity. Wow. Yeah, that sounds like a bang crunch. That's, mm -hmm. wow, that's wild. And it's been here the whole time over in- Yeah, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, it's a very ancient view. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Okay. Dang, dude, this is getting me going. So I uh, I got kind of obsessed with like simulation hypothesis type stuff mm -hmm. uh, because I'm, I work on in a campus ministry and, and students bring it up to me all the time. Mm. So I, I got him pretty deep into the weeds. And this guy, uh, Rizvan Verk, is a computer engineer, uh, computer game engineer. And he wants to connect all these things together, Eastern and Western. He's trying to use it all with the simulation. And then, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, I can't think of his name right now. His book's around here somewhere. Um, like Bostrom or something? No, no. Uh, uh, close, but uh, the consciousness guy, the hard problem. Uh, Chalmers. Oh, Chalmers. Yeah. Chalmers just came out with his book, Reality Plus, and he's kind of doing some similar stuff. Mm. And uh, I want, like, it's coming, I think, if it's not here yet in the in the literature but like models of god and simulation hypothesis and like <laughs> and, it, and it's just popping up in my head that like yeah when he goes to sleep it's like that doesn't have to be analogical on the video game hypothesis uh it's like the kids logging off right yeah, you could take that really literally because right. I mean, the because that's the way the hindu philosophers want to go is they're like well god's not literally sleeping but like right you know they just use it to describe you know, the universe comes to an end mm -hmm. and then basically you do push pause on all the souls. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're just, they're just, cause they're not really like thinking or experiencing anything. You just press pause on them. Yeah. And then when God's ready, he creates the next one, next universe and everything. So yeah, yeah. you could, yeah, you could take, you could push a video game analogy pretty far yeah. uh, with, with this kind of thinking. Yeah. I'm not like, I don't like it. I don't want it to happen, but <laughs> I think it's happening. It, it just pushes the, it pushes the problem back a step. Because then you go, well, okay, wherever base reality is, however many levels you got to go through, let's mm -hmm. talk about that, whether we're yeah. in it or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, dude. So I, I have one more for you. Um, mm -hmm. Physicalism and the incarnation. And this might mm -hmm. not come up in, in class and stuff like that, but it's something you've, you've been going back and forth on. And mm -hmm. I was so pumped because I was, uh, over the weekend, I was at the Society of Christian Philosophers and... Um, we were talking a little bit about physicalism and JT Turner gave a, gave a uh, presentation. And I thought this, I don't, I can't raise it because it's not, I'm, we're supposed to respect their paper and stuff. And oh, it's sure, not, yeah. you don't pull in extra random crap, but I was like, yeah, what about, you know, Christ's incarnation? If you're a Christian physicalist, like Christ has an immaterial soul. We want to say God's immaterial, but yet he's inhabiting this body. So it doesn't seem like a problem. And then I just looked up this morning that you had a paper on this. I was like, dang, this is awesome, man. Can, can you recall some of that? I know a, I'm pulling all, from all your stuff here. Yeah, no, I've got two papers on it. Um, so the first one is in this book called Christian Physicalism. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then um, Keith Hess uh, spotted a hole in the argument, and once he spot, once he pointed it out, I could not unsee it, and so I was like, <laughs> "Okay, I gotta, I gotta fix, I gotta fix it." Um, so what I did was I took aim at Trenton Merricks because he's the, because in terms of like physicalists who've written on the incarnation, there's not a lot of good literature out there right. there's some people who just go oh i love materialism new materialism i'm like okay that's that's but what does that mean and right. hey, you know he's incarnate he's material and i'm like hey, okay okay fine say materiality one more time i swear you know? <laughs> right uh, whereas <laughs> Trenton merrick's is like oh yeah okay here's you know here's the doctrine of the incarnation here's um you know my materialist uh, philosophical anthropology and, and here's how they work together yeah uh and so here so here's what i tried to do is i tried to argue okay if you want an incarnation and you want to have this physicalist account, you're still not going to be able to satisfy what's called the in hypostasia and hypostasia distinction. In and an? Correct. Okay. So an hypostasia means 
not a person. So the human nature is not a person. Yeah. Uh, and so the claim is that like this human nature would not be a person unless it is impersoned in hypostasia by God, the son. Yeah. So the son brings his personhood to this human nature. Yeah. And that, so the I idea mean, is that's how you avoid Nestorianism. But isn't that Apollinarianism? Uh, well, that's what a bunch of critics of the fifth ecumenical council said. They're like, okay. you just brought back Apollinarianism. Yeah. Uh, and it, it gets really muddy and controversial after that. Okay. Um, but, but that was the idea. So, so the, so the claim from like, uh, Merrick's is, okay, well you say you want to be like really traditional, you know, you're like, okay, so you want to say God, the son adopts or not adopts because that's adoptionism. You're being really blatant <laughs> about what your heresy is there. Uh, he assumes an assumption is not adoption. We swear. Uh, okay. he assumes a soul and a body. Yeah. And Merrick's is like, <clears throat> come on, that a soul, a soul, that's just, that is a person and, and a body, a soul and a body. That's a, that's a human person. He's just assuming a human person. That's just Nestorianism on, on its face. Yeah. Like you can dance around it as much as you want. That's, that's, it's on its face. Yeah. But, but Mer Merrick's is like, I got an answer for you. Get rid of that, that pesky soul. Stop being dualist guys. Like, uh, if it's just a body, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no Nestorianism. Yeah. And so my move was to go, ah, you still get Nestorianism. Haha. -ha. Um, was, was the big idea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how, how'd you, how'd you get that? How'd you pin them on that? So this is where, um, well, I'll lay out what I do and then I'll point out what Keith has, uh, uh, argued and was like, yeah, you got a hole here. So, and then I can explain how I fix it. Yeah. So the idea is to go, okay. Um, now if you want to have this in hypostasy and hypostasis distinction, so the human nature is not a person. It is okay. only a person because the son brings his personhood to it. And I'm like, well, okay, well, if say you're a physicalist, a human body, what that's a, that's a human person. Yeah. So it would be a human person even without the incarnation. Uh, so the son's not bringing his personhood to, to the table because that thing, the, the, I mean, a human organism, I mean, that, that, that is a, that is a person already. Yeah. So no, 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 no. Uh, you can't, you can't violate this thing. Uh, you violate this distinction and you might go, well, well, it, it would be a person, uh, it, unless it's assumed. Uh, and at the very first moment of its, of this nature's existence, this physical body's existence, uh, the sun assumes it. So therefore it never had an opportunity to, to develop its own personhood. And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, that's fine. You could do that. You, you know, you know who else did that? Theodore von Mopsustia and Nestorius. Uh, and, and they were kind of condemned for making these statements, but you know, yeah. you can do these things. You can, you can do this if you want, um, yeah. is, is what I pointed out. Uh, so that was kind of the argument to go, like, if this is a problem for, for substance dualism, it's going to be a problem for physicalism as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, there's like this, uh, two thinkers problem for like an, an animalist take where mm -hmm. it's like, you're a person and you're an animal, you know, who's doing the thinking there's two mm -hmm. thinkers and it's, it, it might even be like three thinkers in Christ's case, because you know, he's got an immaterial, he is God, he's got a spirit. Mm -hmm. So now you got three thinkers going on, if you're, if you take an animalist uh, approach to physicalism. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, Hess's uh, whole, what, where... it's, so there was this really obvious problem. I should, I should have thought of it uh, as soon as, again, as soon as he pointed out, I could not unsee it. Mm. Uh, so Merrick's, he doesn't care about being like super traditional on every sure. single detail. Sure. And I was assuming in the argument, the way I lay out the argument, I'm assuming he is, but that is just not true. Um, so on his view, the, there's not this human nature that come like, that's just like kind of laying around and the, the, the son assumes on his view, it's, it's, um, it's not assumption. It's, it's a transformation. So mm -hmm. God, the son transforms into a, a holy material object. Whoa. So he ceases to be immaterial and becomes entirely material. Whoa, dude. Yeah. That that's wild. Yeah, it is. And most people just go, no. So like Brian left out, um, Robin Lee Pettivan and a few others, they just go, that's, that's just not possible. You can't have a, a non-physical object become in a physical object. Like that's just, that's just, that's just a non-starter. Yeah. Don't but you that's like, the, but that's the claim. Like, so, well, yeah. Like if, if he's essentially spirit, maybe you say he's not, maybe he's just, that's an accidental property that God is, that God, the son at least is spirit. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that's so, but don't you have like, does he have Trinity concerns? Like now the son is like, like wholly separate from the father and the spirit. Um, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember if he's written on the Trinity at any point. 
uh, he might not. I mean, I know he affirms the Trinity because I know he's, you know, he's, he's a Christian and he affirms lots of these sort of things, but he might not yeah. have thought enough about it or he might just go, meh, what's the problem? Who cares? Yeah, um, you got indwelling of the Holy Spirit maybe and yeah. Yeah, and there's still ways to have them connected. Uh, or you might just say, well, just because he ceases to be wholly immaterial, why should I think he's disconnected from this, the Father and the Son or the Father yeah, and the Holy if, Spirit? Like, give me we, the details here. Yeah, if we're, and, and if we're physical, and we're not disconnected. Like, we have the mm-hmm. Holy Spirit. We can have a relationship. But yeah, we don't want to. We're not. I'm not in the Godhead, though. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't. I guess I can see the worry you're raising. And I think it's, a, it's the right one. But I think Merrick's can easily just put his foot down and go, you got to spell out exactly what the problem is because yeah. I'm not seeing it. And you just kind of going, well, but. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah. He's just like, well, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, lots of things don't feel right. But uh, right. You know, who cares? Right. So, yeah. so yeah. So I think that that would be the challenge. Uh, and I think the right sort of challenge from him is to be like, give me some details. Uh, yeah. And then, then we can start working it out. Okay. Um, but yeah. So what I had to do in this response paper to, to Keith Hess uh, that's just came out in Philosophia Christi, I think it was a few months ago now, mm-hmm. his, his paper critiquing me and then me going like, yeah, okay, okay. I need to fix this. Uh, so what I do is I go, okay, let's do two moves. One going, okay, I, Trent Merrick's claims he's giving me the, like, you know, like the, the ecumenical account of the incarnation. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, if he wants to go with this transformation account, that's not, that's not the ecumenical account. Cause the right. ecumenical account says God cannot change and God is impassable. And you've got God, the son clearly undergoing a, a huge change yeah. and, uh, and being passable in all these sort of ways. So if you want ecumenical and physicalism, this isn't it. Yeah. If you don't care about getting the entire, all the details of the of the ecumenical creeds, then you know no problem. But you told me you were going to give me right. an ecumenical view, and you didn't. So yeah, so that's the first move. Um, the second move is to go. Okay, well, let's look at somebody who also is a physicalist. And so this guy named um, uh, Glenn Andrews People Peoples Peoples. That's right, it's plural. Um, and and so he has this really cool paper on physicalism and the incarnation in the uh rutledge handbook to uh theological anthropology okay yeah so it's a really good paper uh and he tries to lay out how you do this and so he doesn't have a transformational account and so what he does is he has god the son assuming just a a body okay that's it um because he's like that's what a human person is Uh, and so you can say like the soul meaning it's it's a mind because but that physicalism says minds are identical to like, you know, this physical substance. So yeah. we can capture all the ecumenical language. You might not like the way it does, but it captures all of the language. And so I'm giving you this this assumption relation and not a transformation account of the yeah. information. That so I mean, that sounds like a type of dualism, right? Like you have a body and you have a material soul. And so dualism is possible. Right. Mm-hmm. So like that that might be a good argument for dualism. It seems like it should be because I remember thinking this when I first started looking into this stuff. Um, I was because I was when I originally first started thinking about this was in my undergrad thesis, and I was looking at Nancy Murphy's account of like physicalism, and I'm like, she keeps saying like all these interaction problem and all this kind of stuff, and I'm like, you have been participating in this divine action research agenda for years, developing all these ways for how God interacts with the physical world. Yeah why 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 can like god like do all this interaction stuff but yeah. a soul can't right like I, I i don't know uh i feel like whatever arguments you have like the wind is just cut entirely out of the sails like it's just this, this can't be the case yeah man I, I i catch that too and i've I've caught that from like the panentheist type stuff where they'll those who are dualists uh well it's kind of weird to think about a dualist on that but they, they talk about this interaction problem and they're like look if if you know the universe is god's body and he can interact with it okay and then i think maybe swinburne pulls a move uh similar to that it sounds something like that where like the universe is metaphorically uh god's mm. body like that um, yeah so swinburne does do that because um so swinburne lays out these five criteria for embodiment i can't remember all five of them off the top of my head but the move to say he, he does is like he's like well not every single criteria is satisfied by god's relationship to the universe okay so it's not a full embodiment because okay so one of the criteria is you get like some kind of like input output like sensory input and output from a from a from a body and you're like okay well god's got interaction with it so like there's some sensory input and god has control over the body so it's another condition for embodiment but another condition though is like the the body is sort of like your your uh your locus for viewing the world so i'm 
my all my perspective on the world it's coming from right here from yeah, this right. chunk of matter here right not from you know the chunk of matter over there and he's like well that's not the case with god because because god's like not like his locus isn't just from like you know some chunk of matter or something yeah yeah that's good that's really good dude this has been awesome man we've, we've gone through so much so hopefully that gives everyone a taste of mm -hmm. uh well, god and time and creation we've gone through a lot of that stuff and so just imagine uh four eight hour days of this and then you get to do a research proposal and and ask uh dr mullins here hey is this dumb is this cool is, what do you think and it's awesome so i'm i'm like seriously looking forward to it man it'll be um i believe it's january 2023 is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So like just a, just a year from now, mm -hmm. and um, I'm I'm really looking forward to it, man. Yeah, it should be really good. Yeah, so I, I'm super excited. Uh, I was chatting with Paul Gould yesterday about it, and he's very excited. So, yeah, this is this is gonna be fun. Yeah, it's gonna be sweet to to like see you in person too. Like known you now for a couple of years, we've talked, and it'll be good to see how tall you are and see mm -hmm. like, <laughs> all that good stuff. I'm always surprised by people's heights when I when I see them in person. <laughs> Yeah, this is awesome. Um, well, sweet dude. So I'm gonna I'm gonna drop a link. I think Paul is making a link right now where people can like sign up for the class or get get to know the program a little bit more. Um, and if you're interested in this kind of stuff, if you want to go deeper than um, than just like the apologetics type stuff, not nothing against apologetics, man. I got into philosophy uh, because of apologetics. But if you want to go deeper and if you want to know different models of God and how God relates to time and explain those to people in in the cutting edge literature, right? join this class, like come study with me, be my uh, cohort. And we can, we can continue to learn more from uh, Dr. Ryan Mullins here. Um, Ryan, before, before I let you go, man, where can people find your work in the meantime? We got like a year for them to bone up and, uh, and develop really good questions for you. Mm -hmm. So the main place to go is rtmullins.com because there you can find links to a bunch of my papers, not all of them. And you can find links to some of the books and then my podcast, the reluctant theologian podcast. Awesome. Awesome, man. Yeah. And I love, I love all that stuff. So I'll, I'll put a link to uh, the podcast in the link in the description uh, for again, if you guys like this podcast, if you want to keep me around, uh, please can consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can find a link in the description and check out my sponsor, uh, Biblios clothing company. Uh, if you use the promo code in the link in the description, then you can get 10% off your entire order for, I think it's the rest of this of February. So get on that, buy some stuff, make me look good. That'd be awesome. Ryan, thanks so much for for coming back on the podcast. Can't wait to do it again. You, you got to come on before uh, before this intensive, though. Yeah, sure. Yeah, awesome. Happily. Awesome. All right. Well, it's going to have to do it for now, folks. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.